five, four, three, two, one. Hi, everyone. This is episode seven of That Real Estate Podcast with Henry Matthews. Uh, we are doing our part two here with Alex Powell. Um, in the last episode, we talked about uh, the book that he just released called Getting Your Foot in the Door. And uh, he's been gracious enough to come back and answer a couple more questions because I had quite a few for him and we just kind of ran a little short on time. Again, for anybody watching this, if you like the video, please go ahead and uh, hit the like button. Go ahead and subscribe. It uh, makes the world a difference. And subscribing and hitting the notification bell will ensure that you don't miss any upcoming videos that we release. Um, that being said, Alex, uh, welcome. Thanks, buddy. It's good to be back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that was quick. Yeah. Um, so uh, I just want to try and get into some things here. So Yesterday, we talked about your book, and we kind of danced around a couple of the things that you kind of have going on in your life. Can you fill people in uh, who might be watching that might not be familiar with uh, what you do, um, sort of all the different hats that you wear? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, our company, we have a, a number of different companies, actually. Uh, one uh, of which, the, the, the main one that I deal with is called Pal Property Solutions. So uh, Pal Property Solutions, we're, we're a full-blown real estate investing business. So we deal a lot with joint venture partnerships, uh, dealing with people who you would like to make real estate a part of their diversified portfolio, but never really have had the know-how or the experience or aren't maybe comfortable doing it. Um, there are some intricacies when it comes to investing in real estate, as I'm sure you can probably appreciate. So we typically help people and guide them through the process and, and we partner with them from a, you know, we bring on money partners and we execute and find deals for them and we deploy their capital and we get like wicked returns, like unreal return on investment, like north of 50% in one year in a lot of cases. If not, we've even done like the odd unicorn where you pull out a surplus of money, which is just unreal. Um, so that's one facet of our business that we take care of. We also have a full-blown real estate agent team, uh, the Powell Realty Group. Um, my wife, Kaylee, actually fronts that uh, part of our business. So uh, we have a team of agents and, uh, and we do business typically around the West End. We've actually done Toronto as well, uh, being the crazy market as it has been. So we also uh, have a full-blown construction group called Pal Construction Group. If there's, you can notice there's a bit of a theme here. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we've, uh, we take on a lot of these larger projects. Like, for example, we have a $400,000 project in Welland right now that's going on. We've, uh, we've got eight other projects going around the city so we are uh, uh we're, we're doing some pretty pretty exciting stuff which is really cool to to see and be a part of and uh and last but not least we are now on in the process of kicking off some in-house project management so kind of so, taking some small steps to see uh you know where that's going to take us and uh and it's uh, going to be good and the, it's going to be solutions property management which is uh, which is very exciting uh it's going to be fronted by melissa who's on our team that's amazing. You're a pretty busy guy. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Things are, uh, you know, coming together, but keeps us on our toes. That's for sure. Absolutely. When you say you guys bring on partners to do projects with, mm -hmm. um, what does that look like? Like what kind of people are you looking to partner with? If somebody who might be watching this, you know, might be in a situation where they're kind of looking for somebody that kind of provides your piece of the puzzle. What is that type of person going to look like for you? Like what type of investor are you looking to work with? Well, effectively, um, simply put the, the, the most amount of value that we get from a partner is somebody who's able to qualify for a typical mortgage. That's on like the lower level of like the residential scale, right? Because in residential type properties, so anything five units and less, um, we qualify through like typical lending that anybody else would if they're buying a house. Now with the portfolio that we currently have from a residential standpoint, we actually don't look very favorable in the bank's eyes. It's funny because we have a whole bunch of mortgages, but, uh, but they still are like, no, no, now you're over leveraged. So that's okay. So what we have to do now in order to keep growing our portfolio is we have to partner with other individuals. Um, on the commercial side, it's a bit different on the commercial side. I look like a A plus plus student. So, uh, uh, that's a bit of a different story, but 
what we typically look for in in a in a partner is somebody who is excited about real estate, somebody who who wants to build a portfolio for themselves and just doesn't have the time to do it. And that, that's I find is one of the um, you know when when you look at why real estate, it's typically two main you know reasons. Uh, one is I don't have enough money, and the other is I don't have enough time. And, and the both I I can appreciate both. They're you know, th- that might be the case. I know some people have very demanding jobs. By the time they get home, they have family, kids, whatever has to happen. It can, it can take away a lot. We take on all of the actual action that's related to finding the deal, executing the work, taking care of permits, dealing with the designers and the engineers and, and the inspectors and dealing with everything from the demolition crew to the plumbers, electricians, all the way to the back end property management. We take care of all the books, everything. So it's no different than if you were to put your money into mutual funds or something like that, uh, except this is a different, um, it's a different uh, uh, kind of setup, right? We are coming in as partners, but the person who's coming in provides the finances and the ability to, to qualify, and we provide the execution and the awesome returns. So it's a match made in heaven. Actually, one of our um, one of our real proud uh, accomplishments is that every single one of our joint ventures has become some sort of a repeat customer in one way, shape, or form. So, uh, so it's a I think it's a good testament to the relationships that we build with our investors and to the kind of returns that we get from our investors be- for our investors because um, everyone's been incredibly happy and uh, and, and it, you know that's that's how we liked it like it sorry is is we like to kind of keep this this momentum happening within people because you can really change someone's life by uh by helping them you know with, get into real estate absolutely when you talk about the returns um i i know people are probably more familiar with like what a yearly return on a mutual fund would Mm -hmm. be something like that um what are you typically seeing like like on average what do you guys so i say like be able to return like where your typical mutual fund might be like a four to like maybe six percent kind of like depending up and down uh, different years but on average kind of around that range right now like We've seen north of 50, 80% in one year ROI. Wow, that's quite impressive. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's the benefit of the Burr model is because how we work with our partners is my job is to get that partner's money back out of the deal as soon as possible. That's how our, our um, setup works. That's how our deal structure works with our joint venture partners. So they front the capital on the front end. We take care of all the work. And I want to get that capital back into their hands as soon as possible. And then we co-own the property together and we own it 50-50. So within, let's say, a year, two years, how long it might take, because because property values have increased as much as they have, it's getting harder and harder to find those deals where you can extract all of the capital. So it, it, it's very common that we have to leave some money in the deal. But let's say you're buying a, a property, you're doing all the renovations and you're refinancing it. And let's say you're leaving $40,000 in the deal, but that property is still appreciating. Let's say at an average 4% per year, which is low considering what we've seen in Hamilton lately. It's also cash flowing 500 bucks a month and the mortgage is paying itself down, let's say 10 grand a year. Like that return on investment based on the 40,000 that we still have left in the deal is very, very high. Um, so so it, it becomes, a, uh, the whole idea is leveraging the bank. Us as partners come together in a joint venture agreement to take our capital back out, leverage the bank's money 100%, and then we can just coast it and keep generating cash flow over and over again. It's a beautiful thing. Makes sense. Um, your What you provide is a really good opportunity, I think, for people that are either new to investing in real estate or are a little scared. Um, one of the main things that I hear from clients all the time, friends, family, people looking to kind of get into investing in real estate is they're terrified of tenants. Um, how do you guys handle um, tenant issues? Like, is that something that um, you've kind of come up against a lot? I, I know having someone like yourself sort of spearhead these projects should reduce the amount of issues 
like that because you have a lot more experience. Um, but is that still something that kind of creeps up from time to time? Yes, it, like it happens here and there. Um, I think things happen in, in life to people and tenants are people. And the way I see tenants is that there are customers. However, I can choose to who I would like to be in business with. That's the way it is. So when I do a unit, I, I take a lot of pride in how that unit looks, how it functions. Is it safe? Is it you know, comfortable is that's some place that maybe I could call home. So we, we do, uh, we put a lot of effort into how the, that unit is going to turn out on the back end. But in dealing with problem tenants, of course, we've dealt with problem tenants in the past. Usually what ends up happening is if we've bought a property and we've adopted a tenant or something like that, or like, for example, we, uh, we bought an eight unit apartment building with a partner and we had bought it off of the seller who was in the process of evicting a tenant and she already hadn't paid rent in five months. And we had got her in, Jan we got the property in end of January. She just moved out three days ago. Wow. So she had over a year of non-payment of rent and the LTB is so backlogged that there's very little that you can do. So, you know, cash for Sometimes people aren't motivated by that or they just, you know, can't find anything else. So this is the best they're going to get. But at the end of the day, it's a business. We have to find a way to deal with it. But once again, these are the costs associated with buying these larger scale buildings. So we kind of account for it and we budget accordingly to know that we're going to have to eat it a little bit when it comes to these kind of things. So uh, nowadays, when it comes to us refilling these tenancies, we are very, very strict with with who we allow to to cut get in there. So for example, um, people, everyone needs to have a credit check. Everyone needs to have proof of income. Everyone needs to fill out a full application that provides references of past landlords, work references, personal references. We do call every single one of them. We call their, uh, their employer. We ask, you know, have, how late are they typically when they come in for work, like those kind of things. So we do dive in very deep because, um, because it's a risk right now. Ontario is, is so pro tenant that it's it's become absurd and i and i get that you know there's the the yin to the yang of like property values have become so absurd that i you know it upsets the tenants i appreciate all of that and i think that the that that's something that we need to discuss however if someone's living in a property for free i think that that's morally and ethically like terrible and people should take responsibility for that now we have had situations, for example, uh, we have a, a property in, in Hamilton that the tenant all of a sudden stopped paying rent and they were great for like two years. We got in touch with them and since COVID, they obviously couldn't uh, couldn't pay their bills or they, they lost their jobs. So we work out a payment plan with them and we try and figure out, okay, what can you pay? How much can you pay? We'll go easy. We're not going to bombard you with eviction notices because you're going on rough times. However, we need a bit of a plan of action so that we can work with you. And well, people are more than receptive to that. And so are we. At the end of the day, we uh, we we want our tenants to be very happy and very, uh, you know, feel safe. So as long as they're willing to work with us, then, then why not, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned COVID there. Um, how has COVID affected your business, like on the wide scale? Well, it, it, at the very beginning, it was kind of weird. Like we were all obviously working from home and uh, and we kind of didn't know what was going on or, or what to do or react. But we uh, we kept everyone on the team on. So that was one mandate that said it was going to be very important. So all of our staff was still full, fully employed and working away. Our construction jobs were still underway. So we had a bunch of permanent projects. So they were all considered... Um, uh, you know, uh, what, what was the word for it? Uh, necessary uh, and not to be closed if it was a permitted project or something like that. If I it was residential, anyway. Essential service, yeah. So residential construction was still deemed essential. So um, so those permitted projects still kind of kept going. And then finally, things relaxed a little bit and they started opening things back up and we eventually went back into the office. And um, with the real estate market having spiked as much as it has, it's uh, it's actually been very positive for us. Um, funny enough, uh, when, when it comes to real estate, I, I think no one really expected that it would be, it would have gone this wild, but um, yeah, it's, uh, 
it's it's being it's being good, right? So we'll see now. Like obviously, the markets have appreciated considerably. We'll see how long that lasts for. We'll see if there's going to be you know somewhat of a correction. But I've been pretty optimistic, and I continue to be so, despite that the there's like these lagging indicators that that could play a role like you know lack of immigration um this past year could have a lagging factor however canada just released that new package that they're now you know upping the amount of immigrants they're 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 uh they're aiming to bring in in the next four or five years or whatever and they're upping it to like 130,000 a year so it it's going to have a big influence i think on on real estate and, and if you think that real estate prices are going to go down and you're hoping and wishing for it, um, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can keep wishing because I don't think it's going to happen. So uh, that's all the more reason to, to, you know, get your foot in the door as soon as you can, right? Absolutely. How do you think um, the situation south of the border is going to affect us next year? Um, and particularly that's your business is like, do you see any sort of ripple effect? I mean, I'm sure that there's going to be some. Um, I've always taken this approach that I focus on the things that I can control. And as much as I think that it would be wise to sit down and truly understand the policies that are coming to play and the relationships between U.S. and Canada and you know, what is that going to look like for us? And how is the trade going to now change since, you know, if, if uh, you know, Biden gets sworn in, uh, which it looks like he will be, right? I don't necessarily focus on a lot of that stuff because on my day-to-day -day activity, it doesn't have that much of a bearing. It really doesn't. Even things like, you kind of have to roll with the punches. Um, I'm not in a position where I'm going to start lobbying for something right now if I don't like it or anything like that. So, kind of has to you just kind of got to go with it so i do focus on changing the things that i know i can change and that are going to directly influence uh the people that work for us our business our clients our tenants so at the end of the day that's all you can do i know a lot of people get wrapped up in in the nuances and i and for one it's incredibly entertaining stuff it's like uh filled with drama and all kinds of craziness when you're looking at the news and who's setting what and, and all this. But at the end of the day, it's, I'm a big advocate that, that the news is, has a full blown agenda and their agenda is to make more revenue and it's clicks, it's views, it's, you know, look at us because we're projecting something. Um, you don't know how much more productive you can be in this world if you just shut the news off. And it will not affect your life. I promise you. It's crazy. Yeah, I think a lot of people sort of are living in fear of whatever, you know, it's the election or it's this, it's that. There's always going to be some sort of geopolitical reason to not take action. This yeah. Big, you know, hanging fear that the economy is going to collapse or this, that, and the other thing. And it usually never does. Yeah. The, I, at one of the rain meetings I was at, um, I'll never forget, they had this handout that they, they gave, and it was from, I think, 1920, like the year 1920. And, and it was every single year what the major catastrophe was of that year. And uh, catastrophe or economic change or whatever happened, you know, like all the way through the, the world wars, through, um, you know, through the Cold War, through all, all that stuff. And every single year, it was an excuse why you shouldn't invest in real estate. And it was a really cool, like, well, not, I don't think cool is the right word for it, but it was very fascinating to see that here you have this time frame every single year. And it was like uh, just line items of what was the main news thing that year from like Ebola to like, you know, SARS to God knows what else, right? All through the years. And Every single one was like a reason why people were afraid to enter the market and people stopped taking action. And you look at like where real estate prices are now, let's say in comparison to 1920, which I don't even know what prices were back then, but it's, it's wild. It's crazy. It's like, you know, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Mark Loeffler, he, he always said a, a very true statement 
that that rings uh, still in my head is that people always call me crazy when I'm buying or I always feel bad when I'm buying a property and I feel like I'm paying too much. And then in five years, everyone sits, sits around and calls me a genius. And all I did was took action. And it, there's truth to that, right? You let positive markets do a lot of heavy lifting. A couple of things that I am very confident in is Canada as a whole. If you look like if you look at our two, let's say, largest va- valuated property hubs, um, so like Toronto and Vancouver, let's say, if you compare like expensive properties in downtown Toronto or downtown Vancouver, compare that to properties in downtown London, England. Or how about downtown Hong Kong, or you know, in even in places like uh, like Budapest, you know, Hungary, like 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 there's such a, uh, a a difference in the gap of where values of properties can actually get to. So people have this idea they're like, oh, it can't it can't get much worse. It's going to have to crash. Now compare that to other countries and where things are. Now, everyone, like, you know, if they're especially listening to this podcast, I'm sure they have some interest in real estate. They, they are familiar with the foreign buyers tax that came out a few years back that, you know, kind of shook up the market. And the reason that they had to put the foreign buyers tax was because so much foreign money was pouring into Canada because so many people saw Canada outside of Canada as an incredible place to plant their money. We have we're like what second largest landmass in the world. We have a ton of natural resources where um, that we haven't even come close to, to developing where we're so underdeveloped where immigration is coming in droves. We're very diverse. We welcome just about anybody. Um, and not just that we have an incredible banking sector all across Canada. Our banking system is very robust. You know, you go to the States and every city has like five different banks. We have like five big banks. And if you look at people like even Toronto Dominion, like TD Bank, TD Bank has paid a dividend since prior to World War I every year consistently. And, and so if you look at that, it's like we, we, we're doing pretty good in terms of our um, in terms of the setup that we have here in Canada. I feel very blessed that we're here. Uh, so I think that you know people can make 100 million excuses as to why not. Uh, but, but truly take action, get out there, buy something, make it work for you. I know you got to run. So I want to ask just a couple more questions here. Quick. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is your biggest regret looking back? And if you were, if you had access to a time machine and you could go back to Alex, 20 years old, what would you tell him? I think that, it, you know, it's, it's funny because I'm sure a lot of people would say the biggest regret is not buying more property. But I think that that, that answer is kind of cheese, in my opinion, because I think everybody wishes that, right? If I went back and I could talk to Alex 20 years ago, I would, uh, I would try to teach him what I know now. I think <laughs> it was kind of ridiculous in itself. But It's when you're young, you don't have the experience, you don't have the know-how, you have to go through the motions and you kind of, you evolve as you grow. Um, You mature too. When I was 20 years old, I, uh, God knows what the heck I was doing at that time. But um, I think it would be a challenging thing to do, but if I could pass along some sort of message, I think that it would just be to like have faith in yourself. It's, it's going to be okay. And it's going to work out. Cause I, I, you know, I'm, I'm human too. And, and, you know, I've spent time worrying and, and not sure about, you know, the outcome of certain things. And, and, uh, as I've, I've kind of got done the process and, and, and gotten over it. Like for example, that first property that I bought, I remember like I, I was almost like sick. I was so nervous about buying this property because I just, uh, you know, I, I didn't feel confident that what I was doing was the right thing, but I had run the numbers. So like up, down, sideways, left, right, whatever. And it worked out well. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out like why, but I was just worried about it. And then I did it. And it was like this great thing that, that, that happened. And so like the universe rewarded that 
with a, and a great outcome. So I did it again. And at that point it was like, okay, like, okay, here we go again. Like how does, how does people, how do people buy more than one property? And it was so overwhelming. Like this year we bought 16 properties and it's like, we bought a, like two of them sight unseen and it's like, okay, yeah, put it in. That's it. And it's this process of evolution where you start to become a little bit more comfortable. You start to get more confident in what you're doing. You understand the processes. So you know what to look out for. And I've made mistakes too. So you learn from those and you, you, you keep trying to climb, right? I think that might be a good message for anybody, not just, you know, 20 year old Alex. Yeah. Uh, perhaps. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of people have fear and, and overcoming that is really part of the challenge. Right. Yeah. And, and I get, there, there's people out there that are like stone cold fearless and will jump right in. And, and I admire that. I do. That wasn't me when I first started and I, it had to become something learned. It took a long time for that to happen. And, and it took a lot of trial and error. And like, for instance, even like hiring contractors, I would just learn to do it myself because I was, you know, short on cash. I didn't have a lot of money then. I had enough for the down payment and then I had nothing for construction. So I would like buy these houses and then every paycheck would go towards like lumber or the next drywall order or whatever. I'd wait three paychecks to get it, you know, and then I'd be working evenings and weekends to get it done. But like, I, I look back at those times and I think like, I could have likely been a lot more productive. I could have maybe networked more, met more people, maybe used, understood how to leverage money a little bit better so I could hire professionals and have it rented out sooner, those kind of things. However, I think that those steps, those trials and tribulations, they build character and uh, they build a shitload of experience. And that I'm very grateful for. Like I can, I can have a conversation like an intimate conversation of the intricacies of the job with just about every single trades guy on our, on our job site, all the way from the mechanical to the electrical. Like I've wired up three full houses by myself with ESA permits, you know? So you like my first ESA permit that I did, I had like three pages of deficiencies, you know? <laughs> and by the last house, it was like, I was down to like four or five. You kind of learn how to do it and you, you figure it out. So but now I go on the job site with the electrician. He's explaining what he's going to be doing. It's, it's like we're talking the same lingo and they get that too. So absolutely. Um, Alex, uh, thank you for agreeing to kind of do a second uh, episode yeah, here. Sure. I really appreciate I feel like we could talk for three hours. I know. Me too. not cover everything um, or even come close. But again, I want to thank you. I definitely would love to have you back on at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. You let me know when. And uh, I, I'm a, as I said, uh, Henry, I'm, a, I'm a, a big supporter of these kind of things. I'm a big supporter of people that are sharing information. I, I don't claim to know everything. I have a, a way of doing things. I, I hope people take maybe a nugget or two away from it. If anybody ever wants to reach out and, and needs help, I, I'm always available as well. So, uh, so, but I do want to say, you know, our, my gratitude to you for doing these kind of things. I think it can be very powerful. I really appreciate that. If someone wanted to get in touch with you, what would be the best way for them to reach you? Um, if they send me an email, it's APAL, so A-P-A-L, at palpropertysolutions.com, or they can check out our website. It's www.palpropertysolutions.com, and they can send us an email through there too. Excellent. We'll have that link down below. Again, to anybody watching, if you like the video, please go ahead and subscribe. Hit the like button. Hit the notification bell. All that stuff. Uh, have a great day.